investigation into the death of Michael Brown. They are on the ground, and along with the FBI, they are devoting substantial resources to that investigation. The Attorney General himself will be traveling to Ferguson on Wednesday to meet with the FBI agents and DOJ personnel conducting the federal criminal investigation, and he will receive an update from them on their progress. He will also be meeting with other leaders in the community whose support is so critical to bringing about peace and calm in Ferguson. Uh, Ronald Davis, the director of the DOJ's Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, or COPS, is also tra traveling to Ferguson tomorrow to work with police officials on the ground. We've also had experts from the DOJ's Community Relations Service working in Ferguson since the days after the shooting to foster conversations among local stakeholders and reduce tensions among the community. So let me close uh, just saying a few words about the tensions there. Uh, we have all seen images of protesters and law enforcement in the streets. It's clear that the vast majority of people are peacefully protesting. What's also clear is that a small minority of individuals are not. While I understand the passions and the anger uh, that arise over the death of Michael Brown, giving into that anger by looting or carrying guns and even attacking the police only to serves to raise tensions and stir chaos. It undermines rather than advancing justice. Let me also be clear that our constitutional rights to speak freely, to assemble, and to report in the press must be vigilantly safeguarded, especially in moments like these. There's no excuse for excessive force by police or any action that denies people the right to protest peacefully. Ours is a nation of laws for the citizens who live under them and for the citizens who enforce them. So to a community in Ferguson that is rightly hurting and looking for answers, uh, let me call once again for us to seek some understanding rather than simply holler at each other. Let's seek to heal uh, rather than to wound each other. As Americans, we've got to use this moment to seek out our shared humanity uh, that's been laid bare by this moment. Uh, the potential of a young man and uh, the sorrows of parents, the frustrations of a community, uh, the ideals that we hold as one united American family. Uh, I've said this before. In too many communities around the country, uh, a gulf of mistrust exists between local residents and law enforcement. In too many communities, uh, too many young men of color are left behind and seen only as objects of fear. And through initiatives like My Brother's Keeper, I'm personally committed to changing both perception and reality. And already we're making uh, some significant progress as people of goodwill of all races uh, are ready to chip in. But that requires that we build and not tear down. And that requires we listen uh, and not just shout. Uh, that's how we're going to move forward together, by trying to unite each other and understand each other and not simply divide ourselves from one another. Uh, we're going to have to hold tight to those values uh, in the days ahead. Uh, that's how we bring about justice, and that's how we bring about peace. So with that, I've got uh, a few questions I'm going to take. I'm going to start with Jim Kuhn. I think one of the, the great things about the United States has been uh, our ability to maintain a distinction between our military and domestic law enforcement. Uh, that helps preserve our civil liberties. Uh, that helps ensure that the military is accountable to uh, civilian direction. And uh, that has to be preserved. Um, after 9-11, uh, I think understandably a lot of folks saw local communities that were ill-equipped for a potential catastrophic terrorist attack. Uh, and I think people in Congress, uh, people of goodwill, decided uh, we've got to make sure that they get proper equipment to deal with uh, threats that uh, historically wouldn't arise uh, in uh, local communities. Um, and some of that's been useful. I mean, some law enforcement uh, didn't have radios that they could uh, operate effectively in, in the midst of a disaster. Um, some communities needed 
to be prepared if, in fact, there was a chemical attack and they didn't have uh, hazmat uh, suits. Uh, having said that, uh, I think it's probably useful for us to review uh, how the funding has uh, gone, uh, how local law enforcement has uh, used grant dollars uh, to make sure that uh, what, they're, what they're purchasing is stuff that they actually need. Uh, because, uh, you know, there is a big difference between our military and our local law enforcement, and we don't want those lines blurred. Uh, that would be contrary to our traditions. Uh, and I think that there will be some bipartisan interest in re-examining uh, some of those programs. Uh, with respect to the National Guard, I think it's important just to remember this was a state-activated uh, National Guard, so it's under the charge of the governor. This is not something that uh, we initiated at the federal level. Uh, I spoke to Jay Nixon about this, uh, expressed um, uh, an interest in making sure that uh, if, in fact, a National Guard is used, it is used in a limited and appropriate way. Um, he described the support role. And good morning to our friends at iHeart. This is the autopsy of Michael Brown, the second one, in fact, performed uh, by a team of pathologists. And you will hear from him, Dr. Uh, Bryden, uh, one of the pathologists, has been in the game for a very long time. He looked at the JFK autopsy and also the uh, Martin Luther King. One, he's been doing it for 50 years. He's 80 years old. He gave a news conference uh, earlier uh, on Monday in Ferguson, Missouri, at one of the local churches, the one that... Uh, also, uh, Dr. Sharpton, the national leader, spoke at. And then we'll hear some comments after that from, uh, we, maybe we'll hear him starting this, uh, from uh, President Obama on the ever unfolding situation in Ferguson, Missouri. It is on the front page of every newspaper from San Francisco uh, down to Jackson, Mississippi to Los Angeles, to the New York Times, and papers in between. We looked at some polling also from the Pew people as to how America is looking at uh, this particular event. There was uh, This poll was of a thousand people. It was weighted, however, and we won't get to, into too much of how it was uh, weighted, but nonetheless, the country is somewhat divided. The figures are about the same as they were in the uh, episode of Trevon Martin, one of the most covered events uh, between uh, of a African youth being murdered. And about, uh, let's see, 4 to 1, 80% uh, of African Americans say the shooting raises important uh, concerns. By contrast, 47 to 37, uh, the issue to uh, white Americans. 65% of African Americans, this is the Pew uh, recent poll, the police have gone too far. And this is a, a situation where it's whites are evil and divided, 33% say they have. And 32% say uh, the response is about right. And 35% none. So in other words, one-third, one-third, one-third uh, offered there. It's a partisan divide, 68% uh, to the Democrats. And with the Republicans, it's reversed. 61% say the issue of race has gotten too much attention. We did a, a show uh, last night on uh, militarization of police, and we gave some commentary on it from... The red state, and that is Eric Erickson, and his take on what was going on. Now, we compare this to Trevon Martin. Uh, the it's after the Zimmerman. Zimmerman, of course, is a private citizen. Six percent of whites said race received more attention than it was. But had Trevon Martin been uh, a different color, the issue would not have been there. Majority of Republicans in both Brown and Martin, sixty-one percent, and Martin. 68% uh, said uh, race uh, received too much attention. This is a general polarization 
in uh, 2014 in America. Roughly one in four, 27 percent. Very closely follow this on the news about uh, the uh, African American uh, teenager in Ferguson. Several other stories. It's kind of rate them there. Robin Williams, who who died uh, recently in a tragic situation, 27 percent also followed it, and 25 percent followed Ebola. And uh, the uh, Iraq news, 23 percent and 22 percent. And this is of the news jockeys in the Ukraine. News interest in Trebon Martin in 212 and in the Zimmerman trial in 213. Uh, we're high. Martin's uh, death, 35% of the public followed the story. 70% of African Americans and 30% of whites public interest in uh, the events in uh, Ferguson. Uh, are very similar to, and this is uh, one we covered uh, in Cincinnati of the late uh, Timothy Thomas, 24% there. So you can kind of see a little matrix of what's going on. Interest last week about Ferguson was the highest among uh, non-Latino uh, uh, Africans, Americans. Fully 54% uh, followed the news about the shooting and protests compared with 25% of non-Latino Whites and 18% of Latinos. And there's sort of a breakdown here. You won't go too much into it. Adults 65 and older paid uh, closer attention than younger people. That is uh, to be expected. So that sets up uh, where the autopsy is and what the stratagem was of the attorneys for announcing today. They wanted to get the news out there that Mr. Brown had been shot uh, six times. And this is only preliminary. Now, the x-rays, which are very important, are in the hand of the county coroner of St. Louis County. And they will need these to determine if some of the wounds, for instance, to his arm, some of the exit wounds by his eye, etc., you will hear that, uh, were caused uh, by him throwing up his arm. And remember, this man was six foot four, uh, 290 pounds, almost 300 pounds, very big person. And of the wounds, of uh, the uh, pathologist uh, said that one was fatal, and that was right at the hairline, was a fatal wound to him. And that goes along with basically what the witnesses have talked about, that the police officer was shooting from his car, and also the powder burns on the body indicated at least 30 feet or so of a long distance. In other words, it was not close, uh, uh, close up uh, together as if they were, say, in the car. Uh, they said one bullet went off in the car, but that's very, very doubtful indeed. Now, to get the whole story, they need the clothes, and they don't have the clothes. That is at the St. Louis uh, coroner's office. And also the blood um, and fluid uh, part, which goes into uh, that uh, analysis uh, there, the... Uh, uh, toxic uh, materials uh, there, anything in the body at the time, toxicology, uh, that will uh, come out. Usually what they try to do, uh, again, is disperse people like they did with the shoplifting episode at the Ferguson Market of Mr. Brown, that they'll say, well, he had marijuana. That's what they did with Trevon Martin, but they don't know when he smoked it. And marijuana, uh, cannabis has a very long uh, half-life in the body. But those come out much uh, later, normally about four weeks. Uh, unless they do it right, they can do it in about a week. But the toxicology reports they don't have, and you'll hear this. And the complete package of what happened tonight, one of the things we do understand is that basically the demonstrations were peaceful up till 9.30 or 10 o'clock. And this uh, huge police presence, the Governor Jeremiah Nixon has uh, sent in the National Guard, but their job is to guard the police command headquarters. That's basically what they are doing. But you have an assortment of other police units. I saw one from St. Charles. That was an armored vehicle. And all of these little hamlets around uh, St. Louis, some of the St. Louis City people were there, State Patrol were there. And they're there with sticks, clubs, and they have these uh, deafening uh, devices, uh, that they are they are using there, 
is uh, this all military armor. That's what we were doing earlier tonight, talking about those. Uh, we advise you to check that.